I saw this beautiful photo somewhere on Pinterest and I couldn't resist but to paint it. I thought let's make this a one hour study, just a quick and loose portrait to warm up and practice and let's only use a limited palette of colors to keep things simple. In the end three colors were just enough, but one hour wasn't. I'm afraid that I'm still not quite a loose style painter, but I will get there eventually because I just admire when paintings have clear focus and simply spare the viewer all the nuances that are not too relevant to the main thought, I guess. My study is far from that point, but this was still one of the most enjoyable painting sessions from last month, and I hope that my process can still provide some value. For my limited palette I chose primary colors, uh, yellow, red and blue, and picked their rather strong and saturated representatives. I used Pyro Red by Daniel Smith and then Indian Yellow and Prussian Blue by Schminky Horadam. These paints are probably the most high-end watercolor paints in my collection, but they are such a treat to mix. They are more on the transparent side, but so highly pigmented that I really have no problems mixing near blacks with them, and I knew from the started I'm going to really need dark colors for this study. This is a flesh tone that I mixed for her skin from yellow and red. These mixes can be tricky and if you don't add enough water to make them more transparent, which finally makes them peachy, then they look just too orange and you might think that you mixed it wrong. With watercolor you have to count in the whiteness of the paper and transparency of the paint which acts as a substitute for white paint. If you are learning watercolor painting and you already have experience with gouache, acrylics or even oils, then you're probably going to struggle with mixing for a bit because of the habit to create your mixes with white. I have the same problem of having a watercolor habit when trying to paint with gouache. I can't get my head around adding white paint instead of just clean water. Those are just painting habits that we acquire and we need to switch them in order to learn a new technique. I've decided to start loosely and place all the paints next to each other into the wet background, having them bleed into one another and create this mysterious atmosphere that I loved about the photo so much. Bleeding of the blue paint around the face doesn't bother me much because most of her face will be covered with floating hair anyway and even around the chin there will be blue reflected light and so I managed to control the spreading of the paint more or less with just lifting those pools that has gone too wild. I really love painting wet in wet, it is just the right amount of adventure that I need to keep me interested during the entire process. You never know what will happen and if you can use those surprises to your advantage, that's a great starting point to discover a new approach or even style. When I have people painting wet in wet during live workshops, they get so nervous and scared and I completely understand the respect for the unknown, but I always remind them the worst thing that can happen is that you will get a new piece of paper. And once I place a pile of blank watercolor papers on a side table, that really helps to take the pressure off. I continued working wet in wet until I reached that point where I really needed to start defining face features more precisely and that's when I switched to wet on dry and simply dried the surface beforehand. To mix very dark, nearly black paint, just patiently mix all three primaries together, balancing the mixture according to your needs. For example, I let the red slightly prevail when mixing color for the eyes and some other face features and details, but then added much more Prussian blue for the hair later on. I tried so much to still work a bit looser than how I normally paint and avoid coloring within the lines this time, just to see where this approach takes me. This meant adding the paint where the shadow belongs, but not trying to have it blend seamlessly with the base layer, rather allow for some messy edges to appear. Just to note, I do not think that there is a proper technique to do anything, or at least not from my own self-taught point of view there isn't. Every medium can be used in many ways, while of course respecting and utilizing the strength of every medium. And watercolor especially can be so versatile that experimenting can only benefit you. I have a go-to method of doing portraits right now and I made a video about that approach a few months ago and I will link it down below to the description of this video. 
if you want to check that out but i'm still trying to find different ways to work on a painting and maybe on one boring day i will find myself only using one approach but hopefully that won't happen This technique is called lifting and it allows me to lighten areas even after the pigment has already dried there. I can reveal freckles or reflections in the eyes or on the skin this way and it also allows me to correct and repair watercolor in places that turned out a little messy. It has its limits and the main requirement is a paper that allows for it as well as pigments that do not stain the paper too much. In my experience though paper matters the most because for example this Prussian blue it contains a staining pigment and yet I can lift it with just a bit of effort. My favorite paper for this type of technique is Canzon Moulin de Roi. It is a 100% cotton paper with smoother texture I use cold pressed yet its surface is not as grainy compared to other cold pressed papers and it reacts to watercolor unlike any other paper I've tried. I am working on a video about watercolor papers for you this month. Since I know that those types get so confusing and I didn't even find many reviews that would address certain behaviors of different papers to watercolor and I would like to cover that despite of knowing that it might just be a lot of work. I was trying to search for a soulmate watercolor paper that would completely understand me and the way I want to paint, but for many years I couldn't find any. Archie's got pretty close, but this one got the job. Unfortunately, at the time the Moulin du Roi started to be insanely hard to find and it looked like they stopped making it all together. But about a year ago, I discovered that Jackson's Art Supplies in Britain still have the paper available. They are apparently making and selling it only in Britain now. The last time Jackson's had a paper sale, I bought about six blocks of that paper. Just so thrilled to spend a lot more shipping fees just to get it. This might sound completely insane to many of you and I do not advocate overspending like this and always advise getting the best paper you can from a local art supply store but this is just my emotional attachment to this particular material that I can't get over and I should because the point of my story is that manufacturers they can do whatever they need to do and if they decide to stop making something one day we'll just have to get over it and get used to different art supplies Painting hair is not too challenging, I think, not if they consist of flat color like these really dark strings do. I love to play around with curves and have them freely run around. I never painted too many details within the hair of my portraits, always just suggestions of them as a mess, but also don't forget to paint the shadows of the hair first in more transparent color, that way it will all look a bit more realistic and I really love this dark mixture of color. Best thing about Schminky or Daniel Smith paints is that they don't lose much vibrancy even after they dry and so even the original of this portrait looks full of color. Here I played around with a flat brush to loosely paint in some flowery shapes to decorate the portrait and now when I see this process I have about four new ideas of how to paint this better and I might have to try it next time. I could have stopped right there and nothing bad would have happened. 
Adding white details and reflections has become a habit. I no longer even consider whether adding them benefits the painting and while it really increases the contrast and the face just glows much more after adding them, I should always ask myself twice before making permanent changes like this. I think next time I will either mask the details beforehand with masking fluid or only create soft highlights with lifting, that way the painting will remain softer and calmer. I'm not quite sure how to describe this. Let me know what's your preference, I would love to hear your thoughts. You can find the entire process in real time on my Patreon in my Paint With Me tier and this month there will be even more portrait paintings to choose from and paint with me. And I'll see you again in a few days. Have a great week! Mm -hmm.